The lone figure sits erect, ready for the wave to break, ready for whatever the world is about to unleash upon him. He is serene, or perhaps resigned to the coming test, humble and undaunted because he has faith that he will find a way. He is Frodo Baggins, he is Don Quixote, he is Huck Finn. He is every unlikely hero who ever took a step out the door and found himself swept up in adventure. For there he sits, alone in that field, facing an edge, facing a frontier, facing a wilderness that dwarfs him. And yet he sits, facing it, not turning away, not running away. The little fellow in the photograph is my hiking partner, Atticus M. Finch, named for yet another humble and unlikely literary hero. Since May 21st of last year, he has been kind enough to put up with me as I flung the two of us into our mountain adventures. Up until then, we weren't all that active. We mostly sat around Newburyport. We took little walks in the woods or on the beach, but never too far because I was too heavy and out of shape. Then, last year, after being introduced to the 4,000 footers, we immediately fell head over heels for them and hiked all 48 peaks in 11 weeks. We so rushed through them that I decided to do them again throughout this spring, summer, and fall. And this time we took our time to enjoy them even more. Watching Atticus gazing upon those trees was when I started to celebrate this round of the 48. But more than that, I celebrated this curious little dog. How lucky I am to have him as a hiking partner. Come wind, sun, snow, or rain, he has been with me every step of the way. Most of the time, it's been just the two of us and our tight bond has grown even stronger. When I saw him sitting, facing that wilderness, I thought of all those unlikely heroes in literature who faced unimagined challenges and come out seasoned and strangely different. In the end, they became more than they'd ever been. And you just knew that through sadness and joy, through good days and bad, no matter what happened next, after the story ended and they walked off into the sunset, they could handle all the trials and tribulations that life had in store for them. That was Tom Ryan reading from his book, Following Atticus, a truly wonderful story. Thank you for joining me here on the Educational Forum. I am Diane Sullivan, your host for today's program. Let's begin with your life as editor and publisher of your own newspaper known as The Undertoad in Newburyport, Massachusetts. Let's start there. I really wanted to leave that part behind. That's why I moved to the mountains. <laughs> Tell me how you were spending your days, your time, your life, how much you were devoted to that paper. I know you were a workaholic at the time. I was. Everything was. My whole identity was uh, tied in with the paper, doing the, the toad, as we called it in Newburyport. Uh, and all day long, as soon as I got up, I'd have breakfast with people who would talk about issues in the city. I would keep them off the record so I could protect their identities. In a small city, you know how important that is. Yes. Uh, during the mornings, I would meet with business officials and store owners and uh, talk to what was going on. Uh, at lunch, I'd have lunch with different people, talk to them. And then uh, city, uh, city hall at night, every night I was in City Hall going to meetings Monday through Thursday night. Describe, if you would, the political landscape of Newburyport. I mean, what was it like there? It's no longer like that. I was fortunate to come in at a perfect, perfect storm. Um, we had our first female mayor, and she was an outsider, and she was a lesbian, and she was running for re-election, and the good old boy network didn't like that. I bet. And so they started going after her, Diane, uh, for all the wrong reasons. They went after her for her sexual orientation. They used rumors. They used innuendo. And I think I was the first person who came along since Bossy Gillis back in the first half of the century or uh, William Lloyd Garrison who started naming names saying, hey, this person's saying this about the mayor. And they would call them out. And it sort of made of a nice, fair fight. Uh, I'm from an Irish Catholic family. I liked fights. And I didn't like the way they were beating up on her. And... Uh, that's what I jumped into. It was a perfect fray for a new writer who didn't know anything about writing, but has all these wonderful characters to write about. Tell the audience, though, a little bit about the incident with the police and your trash. I mean, I think that talks about the small town political life. 
Well, you said the incident. When you start out saying it's the incident about, with the police, I'm going to say which one. <laughs> the qualifier is the trash. Well, I never put up my trash the night before a trash collection like all my neighbors did. This guy's warned not to. They, and someone said, well, the police will go through it because there were some members of the department who were doing things they shouldn't have been doing. Sure. And some of the good members of the department were telling me about them. And the department wanted to know where this information was coming from. And they said, whatever you do, they're going to find anything they can on you. They don't know anything about you. They're trying to find something. So don't put out your trash the night before. And one night I did. And I went to City Hall. And I came back. It was the first time I put out my trash at night in like six or seven years. Mm -hmm. And it was missing. Gone. Gone. And the next night I was at City Hall. And a police officer came in and said, if you want to see your trash, come outside in the alleyway between City Hall and the police department. In about 10 minutes, a couple of detectives will be bringing it up to the dumpster. They've been going through it, trying to find what they can on you. Wow, and they found nothing. In the book, I say they're looking for anything horrible, a list of yeah. informants that would root out some of their informants in the department, or child pornography, or drugs, or whatever. But I said, I'm a big guy, uh, and boring. All they found were uh, Ben and Jerry containers <laughs> and Big Mac containers. And why do you think they let you know that they had your trash and not well, they just kept it one of, the, one of the informants let me know. Uh, and it was sort of funny, even some of the cops we would call shadier police officers at the time, they would often give me information because it was a very incestuous department and they wanted to go after each other. Sure. And so there's always someone in a small town. And Newburyport is a city of 18,000, but it reminded me of a southern town where everyone's talking and a small place where everyone seemed to know your name. Which made your work, though, interesting, I'm sure. I didn't have to dig for anything. Yeah, right. And exactly. I used probably about 1% of what I heard. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the hottest part of the job. <laughs> Deciding it, what to write about. It was. Yeah. It was. Let's leave the political uh, life of Newburyport, and I'd like you to introduce us to your father, Jack Ryan. Well, Jack Ryan's the reason I get involved in the political life of Newburyport, I'm sure. Jack Ryan is the uh, liberal Archie Bunker, was the liberal Archie Bunker when he's still alive. Um, he was so proud of the Kennedys, so proud of Hubert Humphrey. I remember one of the only times I saw him crying was when Hubert Humphrey lost to Nixon. He would campaign for Democratic candidates everywhere. Whenever he took us on vacation, we'd always stop at historical places. He was proud of the work they were doing in Washington and down south for equality. And it, he just would write letters to the editor about that. And my father loved the idea that I was writing a paper because he always wanted to be a newspaper man. Tell us about the rest of your family. Introduce us to your siblings, if you would. Well, I, that was one of the most difficult parts of the book. Uh, Andre DeBuse, who lives in Newburyport, a great writer uh, who wrote The House of Sand and Fog, just wrote Townie about his own memoir of growing up. And he had to decide where to draw the line between family, what he's going to include about their lives and his. And he only tried to put in what intersected between the two. I made a, uh, a great effort to keep them out of it as much as possible. But um, I think we're all beaten physically and emotionally. I was the youngest, I probably had, it li I, had I didn't have it as bad as the others probably. But um, I think in some ways, in my eyes, because I was a romantic, I was a dreamer, I wanted great things to happen. They seemed to leave home beaten and downtrodden and they never seemed to recapture it for the most part. They seemed to be sad. Um, decent people, good people, it's just that they gave up in their dreams. Um, for instance, since the book has come out, uh, the, 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 you know, People I know everywhere, oh, congratulations, this is fantastic, what a great success. And I may have heard from two of them. And there's, it's no fighting, it's just, they, it's in an, a sense of indifference that uh, I, I think my brother David summed it best, my father beat the joy out of some of them, yeah. perhaps when we were young. Very sad to hear, but once again, Irish family, which I'm a part of, you know, my, my father, I remember, spanked me once when I was five. I told my mom to shut up. He cried after he did. He didn't bother me any. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> but I understand full well from the ethnic community I grew up in. It was very typical of the time. Well, you had it easy. We cried after my father spanked us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not the other way around. Yeah, not the other way. And, and so, some of my brothers and sisters are very accomplished. They're very good at what they do. Yep. Um, but lives are littered, and my life used to be littered with uh, a wasteland of relationships. And not expressing yourself right. and it was important to me uh, not to say I was better than them but I wanted something different than they had and whatever they had may work for them or not but it wasn't what I wanted. You never gave up your dreams? No I didn't it made for a very rocky road of it. <laughs> yeah.
I didn't have much of a base to work on. You know, you, I think it's Thoreau or Emerson talks about, you know, hold fast to the ground but reach up to the stars. Um, I didn't have anything to hold on to. I was a bit of a gypsy trying to find that dream that was going to take me away. And the undertow ended up being that. I, in some ways, a, a blogger in Newburyport named Mary Eaton suggest that maybe I wrote The Undertoad because I was trying to fix the world because I couldn't fix it when I was growing up. Interesting thought, isn't that? Yeah. Let's change focus again. You received at one point in your life what I will say is an email that changes your life. It's from Nancy, who's on the zoning board, and tell the audience about that email. I always think it's funny. Uh, Joseph Campbell, who I'm a big fan of, the mythologist, always talks about we have to be willing to get rid of the life we're leading to get the life we're supposed to be living. She sent out an email uh, requesting uh, finding a home, looking for a home for an unwanted dog, a miniature schnauzer. And I didn't know what a miniature schnauzer was. So I went and looked it up online and it was one of these god-awful, barky, yappy little dogs. And I knew I didn't want one. Uh, and I couldn't figure out who would possibly want one. So I didn't have any money to contribute to good causes, so I used to publicize them in my paper. I used to write things for people and put in free advertisements for uh, nonprofits. And this was what I considered, even though it was a nonprofit, it was a good cause. And so I decided I would uh, put an ad in the paper and say, yeah, so I wrote to Nancy, I'll be glad to help you find a home. But that's not what I wrote. What I actually wrote was, I'll take him. And I'm not sure how I did that. Uh, I pushed the send button, and as soon as I did, I was like, oh, shoot. But, but I didn't say shoot. <laughs> because I remember you wrote in the book you had thought sometime in the future you might get yourself a man's dog, a big lab, right? Yeah, a black lab. That's what I had years before. And yeah, that's what I would want a man's dog. And, man's um, dog. But uh, no, I ended up with Max, an unwanted 12 or 13 or 11 year old minister schnauzer who was somewhat neglected and misunderstood and unwanted. How did he change you? He changed me. Uh, by forcing me to take care of something other than myself. I was writing about the city, but I would go home and I'd sit by myself and do my own thing. But when I came home, there was this creature, this being who needed help and needed someone to feed him and to walk him and to water him to make sure he's taken care of. And for the first time in my adult life, I started doing that for someone. And it, it made me grow as an individual and it made me take care of someone other than myself. And it was great to have that learning curve of loving something, loving a family. And it's for the first time I had a bit of a family unit with me. And he sets the stage, does he not, for our buddy here, Atticus? Yeah, we have the only dog book where the dog dies in the beginning of the story yeah. and lives in the end. I opened reading that and I said, oh, I don't know about this book. But anyway, you saved the day with our friend Atticus. Well, I say that Maxwell, Garrison, Gillis, and Garrison and Gillis come from two previous muckrakers in Newburyport, William Lloyd Garrison and Bossy Gillis. So he came as Max, he ended up as Maxwell, Garrison, Gillis. and said he died and he left, but he left the door open for Atticus Maxwell Finch to walk through. Wonderful. Carry him everywhere you go. Don't let anyone else hold him during that period. That's the message from Paige Atticus's Greta. Take the story from there if you would. You know, someone says, why climb mountains when you don't know anything about it? Why start a newspaper when you don't know anything about it? Why raise a puppy when you can get a, uh, a rescue dog who's mature and is already somewhat trained? Because sometimes ignorance is bliss. Um, I didn't know what I was doing. I just know I wanted a dog like Max and I went around looking for a shelter dogs, but I couldn't find another miniature schnauzer. I went online, found a brother and sister in the mid Atlantic states who no one wanted because they had to come as a team. I said, I'll take them. I did the phone interview for an hour. They thought it was a great candidate. And at the end, they said, Oh, this is going to be fantastic. You're going to be wonderful with these dogs. And I said, They'll love New Report. If they behave like Max did, they'll love the woods and the beach and they'll love the swamps and they'll get to run off leash if they behave. And the woman said, you'd let them off leash? I said, well, if they're good with it. And she said, then you don't deserve a dog. Oh, no. So I ended up getting a puppy. That's why I did not rescue again. And I ended up getting Atticus. And I found a breeder online. Oh, she found me. I ended a database. And all these breeders responded. And uh, there was one down south in Louisiana named Paige Foster who kept sending me dogs, pictures of these micro mini schnauzers that look too perfect. As big as they get is five pounds. And I kept saying, no, no, no. She said, well, what are you looking for? So I finally told her, it wasn't a look. 
so much as a feel. And I told her what Max meant to me and how he changed my life. And eventually she sent back a picture. She said, well, I have this one last dog. And um, he's a little different. And he wasn't posed like the others. He was looking sort of bored uh, by the whole picture taking process. And he could care less about the camera. And uh, the picture I saw, I said, that's the one I want. Um, and so she gave me the advice of carry him everywhere you go the first month or two. Don't let anyone else hold him. And it'll create a bond. You all will bond that way, she said. A nice Southern woman. And it, it is the basis of our relationship, uh, the set of trust. Uh, you see Atticus is off leash. He hasn't had a leash on for years. He's atypical for motion dogs who can be hyperactive. Very smart dogs, very smart breed but he doesn't bark like a lot of them do. He's very quiet. And on our blog, you can see pictures of him with bears and moose, uh, where he's really relaxed. I saw those, the moose in the background, and he's just looking at it. Yeah. My dogs would be barking like crazy. I'm very fortunate. In that relationship, he's the calm one. <laughs> yeah, it's just the opposite. And it's not too often you can find a breeder who's going to, not only do you buy the dog and they'll give you advice the first week or two, but whenever I needed something, any of the people who uh, purchased a dog from Paige Foster could go back to her at any time and ask her things. 24 hours a day you could call, and they were her babies. She put them out there, and she'd been doing it for years, and it meant a lot that they had good homes. And she becomes a sounding board for you through the years when you have questions. You do just that. You, I do. You, you contact, uh, and you know Paige will give you her advice. I trusted her as so funny. As a newspaper man writing about villains and would-be villains and shady characters and an occasional hero. I would usually look for what a person was lacking and pick up on that. But with Paige, because I was so want, loved what Max had brought into my life, I looked at her in a different way. I looked at her with willingness to learn and she was willing to teach. And uh, she would later tell me, I've sold tons of dogs for the years, so you're the only one who carried out my advice <laughs> to a T. And it's because I knew I didn't know anything and I wanted him to turn out well. In some ways, I wanted him to have the life that Max never had. And in other ways, I wanted uh, him to have the childhood I didn't have, and I wish I had had. So that's why I followed her. And she seemed to know what she was talking about. You know, it's interesting. I think my dogs have a great life, but I come here and I say, there's one up, okay? Atticus has even a better life than they do. Look around at this beautiful location. You don't see him on a leash. He listens to what you say, and he's totally devoted it's really truly wonderful i'm very fortunate he uh turned out the way he did and that's some of that has to do with Paige's advice and some of it has to do with her opinion that he was a little bit different why his name atticus m finch i always loved kill a mockingbird atticus finch the main character harper lee's character uh, a wonderful literary hero and film hero and one of my friends said by naming him Atticus, it would be so appropriate. And I said, why? He said, well, you've done what he did in the movie. You've come to a town, in a small town, where people are opinionated, and you've taken stands that aren't always popular. And uh, you, uh, so I think it's a perfect fit. So that's why I chose Atticus Maxwell Finch. Great, great name. Tell me how your life changes in caring for Atticus. My homophobic father, who's very tough, couldn't believe a... 300 pound guy walking around with a little five pound puppy in my arms for the first month. <laughs> he, he, he would cringe whenever he saw that. But and that tenderness and taking care of him, and again, it's something that Max had started uh, and right. made me pay attention to it. And I felt responsible for her life. I wanted this little creature. I didn't have kids or, and I'd never been married. So this might be my only chance at a family. So I decided I want to raise him. So I would lean on Paige's advice and again, treat him as wish, I wished I'd been treated. And so we do things together and I take him places and we go for longer walks and I'd start to lose weight. I went on the South Beach diet so I could make a block up the street where I could barely walk without my back hurting. And we'd walk on the beach more. We'd go to the woods. Um, and for the first time in seven years, I spent the night out of Newburyport. I went to Vermont. We went to the Mad River Valley and, uh, and Waitsfield and used a friend's house. And Atticus and I, he was probably 12 weeks old, 16 weeks all the time, our family vacation. Right, you talk about that weekend, the two of you go to the farmhouse being the first time in seven years that you take a break from things. And how does that experience change you? Well, first of all, that night was horrifying. <laughs> I'm so used, I lived right on State Street in Newburyport and the cars are coming and going, the bars opening, closing, sirens, and it's, it's a beautiful town and nothing like 
some other places. In the middle of Waitsfield, where there's nothing around but coyotes off in the distance howling, <laughs> there's no phone ringing, there's no computer, there was no television. And I remember getting there the first night and thinking, I'm so depressed, I can't take this. And the second night, I called a friend of mine who's a therapist, and I said, she said, you might have trouble going up there. I said, why? She said, you'll see. Okay. And I found out I was decompressing and going okay. through this decompression. And she said, maybe you'll feel better tomorrow. And the next day I woke up and it was even worse. But by the fourth day, I didn't want to go home. And it felt so good. And it was almost like uh, detoxing yes. from my uh, workaholic life with the undertow and figuring out, this is really nice. Sitting in the backyard uh, in an Adirondack chair with Atticus, looking up at these big white puffy clouds flying above in the Vermont sky. Ah, and breathing deeply. Yes. <laughs> You write, and I'm going to quote you now, that, quote, when my father and I went to war with each other, I left behind the mountains of my childhood, just as I left him behind. What did you mean when you wrote that? He loved the White Mountains. You know, when you're an Irish Catholic, big family, you either go to the Cape in Massachusetts or you go to the mountains. The mountains were cheaper. And uh, we would come to the campgrounds along the Kangamagas Highway or in Franconia Notch. And up here, he seemed different. He seemed happier. He seemed freer. He seemed less stressed, less angry. And there was a sense of awe in the way he would look at things. And it was one of the only times as a kid I can remember feeling we're equals. And this is someone I really love. I mean, I loved him, but I feared him. I think we all sure. did. Uh, but when he'd stand on top of Cannon Mountain, we'd take the tram up and look off at Franconia Ridge. And, and back then, when you're a kid, you don't know that the mountains don't go on forever. Even though you only live three hours away, you think, as far as you can see, there's mountains. Now I know differently, but back then it was a dream world. And seeing his face, it was like he was also a six-year-old or a 10-year-old, whatever I was at the time, that same sense of spirit. And I could feel him relax and hear him sigh and take in the happiness. You develop a relationship in Newburyport at the Clothiers with John and Dee Dee. And then you have a plan, and that plan is for you and Atticus to hike 48 peaks. Am I right about that? Well, uh, one of my brothers was working on climbing each of the 48, 4,000 foot peaks. And this is something John and Dee Dee, my friends, had done at John uh, Farley Clothiers. Uh, they, were, they, they didn't do all 48, but they were just starting on them. But I was always intrigued by their adventures. Mm -hmm. And one of my brothers invited me and Atticus to go with him and two other brothers on the climb up Mount Garfield in September of 2004. And I wasn't sure if we could do it. I had lost a lot of weight at the time. And Atticus and I had been walking a great deal, but I'd never really climbed a mountain. But we went with him and my other brothers. And we all struggled up the mountain. Four middle-aged Irish Catholic <laughs> boys with nothing to say to each other. Talk about dysfunction. The only thing that came out were four-letter words yeah. and grunts and groans and little seven-year-old questions saying, how much further? Are we there yet? <laughs> and hating the fact there were no views and it was hot and sticky and there yeah. were bugs and yeah. cramps. Yeah. But when we got to the top, I realized the only one who hadn't struggled was little Atticus. Uh, and he was sitting off in the distance, looking off. And by the time we stopped gasping, we get to the top. And if you go to Mount Garfield, it's, it's in the northern part of the Pema Juasa Wilderness. And to your right is this beautiful string of Franconia Ridge. And off in the distance, the Osceolas. And over here is the Twins and the Bonds. And it's like an amphitheater. And down below you, this great sweeping lawn of forest below you. It looks like a beautiful green blanket. And it was a perfect day. And I couldn't believe something so perfect existed so close to Newburyport. And I fell in love at that time. I quoted Robert Frost saying something about, you know you're reading something great because at that moment you read it, you'll know you'll never forget it. And I remember seeing that and saying, I will never forget this moment. And um, watching Atticus look off in the distance and taking in the views and not sitting, not, not moving anything but his head and his eyes, just sitting there. And one woman said, he looks like a Buddha the way he was sitting there. And other dogs on the trail, they'll have a great time. They run back and forth, up and go side to side into the woods, chase after this, chase after that. They do three times as much hiking as people. And they get to the top, they're looking for food from people, and they're begging. Yeah. Not him. He's always that constant 10 yards ahead of me. And if I stop, he stops on the trail. But when we get to the top, he just he found this serene place, a very peaceful place. It's a wonderful part of the book, that family hike story and what happens, by the way. I really very, very much enjoy that. You and Atticus do start hiking, and you say that when the two of you are in the mountains, you change. Well, after I did that hike with my brothers, throughout that whole winter, I couldn't stop thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And I kept thinking about it, and it was very mythic dreams, and I wanted to do them. But I said, how would you do this 48, and how can you walk 18 miles or 23 miles? They're all different distances. 
and I have a fear of heights, so that complicated things, <laughs> but I couldn't help it. And I, the next summer, Atticus and I went back and see how many we could do. And we did all 48 in 11 weeks. And we wow. did change. It was decompression to the max. It was every time you walk into the woods, it was like going to C.S. Lewis's wardrobe. You go through the back and you push through the, the trees and you're away from the cars and you're away from the phones. And even back then, in the 2004 cell phones still weren't as like they are now, as crazy as everywhere. So you have this great privacy and oftentimes we didn't see anyone for hours on end, if at all. And you like that the best? At first it scared me. Yeah. There's a bit of a nervousness to it because I'm not used to it. Yeah. But then I loved it and I loved being on our own. Everyone says, what's your favorite peak? And I said, wherever we can be alone. Because how often you get to a place, we, you're not really in danger, but it feels sort of nervous and exciting to be there. And because you're on your own, you're not used to it. And then you find it to be therapeutic. Incredibly therapeutic. To the point where we, you know, a friend of mine, Parky Jones, is a therapist back in Newburyport. Mm -hmm. And I, I said, this is what it must be like going to therapy with Parky. But for, not, for 90 minutes, this must be like a year's worth of therapy going on one hike. Because you're working up the mountain, you're, you're getting more and more tired. It's hard. You're cramping. You're sweating. And sometimes you're like, why the heck am I doing this? But by the time you get to the top and you see the views, you've worn everything off. And the old Catholic in me says, you know, you've, you've paid your penance and now you're having communion. And you see the views and you look out and what I compare to like the face of God, this incredible feeling and that sense of awe that I used to see in my father's face would come on my face and I could feel it. And, and the Atticus too. Can you imagine though the people that you do see, the other hikers, and they see Atticus, this 20 pound little dog in the lead, leading you up the mountain. And here you come, as you just described yourself, huffing and puffing along, trying to make it to the top. What do they say? What do they think? To At the time, uh, so different now. Now they say, is that Atticus? <laughs> yeah. And I say, no. <laughs> it's not, it's but they spark. don't remember your no, name, no. do they? Atticus, <laughs> no. they do. Oh, it, was, it was strange. People would make all kinds of comments. I bet. Uh, you you know, they typically see a bigger dog hiking. Right, a lab. A lab or a husky or something like that. And here's this little 20 pound miniature schnauzer and taking it all in and, and you know, some guys would make fun of him. Oh, that's not acceptable. No, <laughs> you, you know, again, you can say anything you want about yeah. me, but don't say anything about my mother or my dog. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> and one fellow on top of Mount Muslock was going on and on because he had two big dogs and all his buddies were there and they had beer they were drinking. Uh -huh. And he said, does that little dog really make it up this mountain? Did you have to carry him at all? How much did you have to carry that little, that little dog, that little girl dog? And I said, it's, it's a guy dog. And he said, no, little dogs are all girl dogs. <laughs> I said, well, I had to lift him once in Mount Washington last year when we were climbing in the winter. He said, you climb Mount Washington in the winter? I said, a few times now. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the undertow still care of that. I have embraced this wonderful, peaceful life up here, but the undertow still exists within me. <laughs> You, you talk about how your writing changes as you begin hiking. You stop really focusing on everything that's the matter in the world, and you see what's right in the world. I wonder if you'd comment on that. Yeah, the uh, American Nari Ophthalmology Department uh, organization talks about uh, that lightness wins out over dark. And when you write a controversial newspaper, you're weeding the garden. You're shining light in the dark places. Yeah. I always held up heroes or people I admired in New Report because I thought they should get credit for just doing their job. But the nature of papers is to write about things that are out of whack. Right. And especially us when we were reforming a lot of things, or muckraking, depending on what my critics would say, or my fans. But you do, you go from looking at this person's cheating on his time card, cheating on his wife while he's supposed to be directing traffic, or they're trying to sneak taxpayer dollar through to a developer who shouldn't get it. And you walk into a city hall meeting and you can tell by the shiftiness of who's going to be lying and who's not. But in the mountains, you're seeing, and I don't go to church, but God's glory, or whatever you want to call it, uh, the great universe. Uh, I think uh, Emerson referred to it as the oversoul. Uh, and it's just this beautiful vision of nature. I mean, look around, you look behind us, the water, the rocks, the trees, it's, it's purifying. It's an unbelievable way to live. It is. It is. Your relationship at this time now starts to improve with your father. Is that a result of your time up here? That and Atticus, I'm sure. Yeah. You've seen this many times over, and including in yourself at times. We become more human because of dogs oftentimes. Animals make us more human because yes, they bring out our better sides. That's right. Um, but my father did love these mountains. I would write about him and call him about them each time we'd hike one. 
And my most popular column in the Undertoad was a letter home. It was an actual letter home to my father, and I'd write to him about our experiences. And, you know, after he died, my aunt tells me he loved Newburyport. He loved it. I said he'd never been there. And she lives out in the West Coast. And, he, and she said he'd never been there. He talked like he knew it. I said, because I wrote him letters about it. And so he felt he was there, and everyone in Newburyport felt they knew him. When he was in a car accident, it was on the local radio station in Newburyport. People reached out to me, and I couldn't go on a regular day walking down the street without 15, 20 people saying, say hello to your father for me, even though they never <laughs> met him. So it created a nice thing, and it, it gave him something to be proud of, that his son was doing something he wished he had done, climb the mountains and also writing a newspaper. He was retired from the telephone company, and he was a frustrated writer who wrote letters to the editor, but he wished he could done more with his writing, I think. So you're carrying on, in, in a way, some of his dreams. I like to think I do my best to adopt the best parts of him, the parts that didn't give up, the parts that, as a little boy, wanted to be something more than he was. Yes. Um, and this is, going back to my family, it's so hard to write about people you love in a way that's not flattering. And a memoir can be rough on yourself, it can be rough on other people. I think sometimes my father beat it out of them emotionally and, and physically to the point that what they were left with was his indifference at times, his frustration. Uh, and it's funny, none of them are horrible to think they're great with their kids, but they just don't have, they're not, they're not, they're not uh, bad people, they're just sad, like I say. Yeah. Um, so I had to make a choice, and I chose to adopt the part of my father that I thought was the best part of him, um, and embrace that, and that's helped me, that helped me heal with him. We still would go months at times without talking because he would misbehave. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd give him warnings. I'd say, three strikes and you're out again, Jack. Uh, but in the past, I wouldn't be able to say that. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the chapter, People Die Up There in the Winter. Well, after we'd hiked in the summer and hiked all 48 and 11 weeks, someone suggested, don't even think about hiking in the winter. Good advice. Yeah, and I said, of course. I wouldn't <laughs> yeah. dare go up there in the winter. <laughs> yeah, with a 20-pound dog. <laughs> but those mountains kept calling, and then, you know, September and October, November rolling around, and, and again, those dreams kept coming back and the adventure was calling and I couldn't believe it. And I'm having these dreams of Atticus and I on top of mountains and I said, I can't do it. Dark in the winter, it's cold. And, and people do die up here, 130 something people on Mount Washington that we know of, you know, and yep. tons, of, tons of death and sadness and rescues. And yet I couldn't help it. So I started going to EMS and buying gear and I knew we were gonna do it. And it was one of the funny things, I walked in there and they'd look at my big belly and my double chins and my little dog and they'd say, no, people die up there in the winter <laughs> when they found out what I wanted to do. But I always joke that they never stopped them from selling me three thousand dollars worth of gear <laughs> because they figured I might not be coming <laughs> <help> back. <laughs> <laughs> they, they wanted to get that sale before I croaked. Um, but yeah, so and my friends would say the same thing: "What are you nuts? Why would you go up there?" Right. And, and at the time, only one dog had ever hiked the four thousand footers in winter. It was a Newfoundland, a hundred and sixty pound Newfoundland, course. made right. for a winter hiking. Right. So I had to equip Atticus with a bodysuit and boots for Mutlux. And uh, we didn't know what we were going to do. Ignorance is bliss. But I trusted our relationship enough to know that if we weren't comfortable together, one of us would let the other one know. And there were a few times that first winter when I do describe Atticus jumping out of the car to get ready to hike in Franconia Notch. I'm going to climb Lafayette Lincoln. And he jumps out, and it's windy and cold. And within two seconds, he jumps back in. And that was it. I met a fellow one time who said, I tried to get up on Bond Cliff with my dog and he wouldn't go because the storm and the winds and the snow was too much for him. Big dog. And he wouldn't go, so I had to kick him to get him up there. What would you have done if you were, in, if you were there with us? And I said, I would have kicked you. <laughs> <laughs> but I think one of the responsibilities I had with Atticus, it was like with a child, listen, dogs can lead us to certain places, animals can, horses, other animals. But we have a responsibility to make sure they're safe too. Luckily, with the way I carried Atticus at Paige's advice, it create, you all will create a bond, she said. And it did. So he had no problem telling me when he didn't want to go further, and I had no trouble listening to him. That's right. And in many ways, that protected you from the weather and the elements. Perfectly. Yeah. Because if I would endanger him, I would endanger me. Sure. So we watched. And one of the challenges of hiking in the winter with Atticus is, you know, people can say, I'm going to do, do Mount Washington today, and I'm going to do Mount Lafayette and Mount Lincoln. We can't. We have to do Mount Washington, Mount Monroe, Mount Eisenhower, Mount Pierce in one day because there's only so many days above tree line. Uh, we can't just do Lafayette and Lincoln. We have to do Lafayette, Lincoln, uh, Liberty, and Flume, all four of Franconia Ridge. So we have longer hikes, but it makes sure we are safer. 
Right. Wonderful. And luckily, I have plenty of carbohydrates stored up through the years <laughs> to have energy. <laughs> you write in your book, and these are your words, Atticus and I proved that if an overweight, middle-aged fellow with a fear of heights and a 20-pound miniature schnauzer could hike 4,000 footers, nearly anybody could. Yes, it's true. And I think nearly anyone can. Uh, even this winter, uh, incredible stuff. Now, we had a record winter where there's no elements up here at all. And they had records of the number of people doing all 4,000 foot peaks in one winter, and they, uh, like never before. And even a wonderful uh, Randy Pierce, a blind fellow, uh, went with his guide dog and with his team, and he made all the, all the summits. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I think anyone can. But the hiking community didn't always appreciate that. Because they like to come up from work, these accountants and these doctors, and they'd say to the co-workers, we're going to go up and climb Washington this weekend. Yeah, and the co-workers, and my college buddies. And they'd say, oh my gosh, you're really going to do that? And uh, I read about that in our first winter, of, we were sitting on top of Mount Washington, and it, we waited for the perfect day, and Atticus and I are sitting on Washington, there's no wind, it's like 30 degrees, but it feels like this. I don't have much more than this on up top, I have Gore-Tex pants on. And he's sitting comfortably next to me on the top of Mount Washington where all these people have died and we're by ourselves and we're eating a peanut butter jelly sandwich. And off in the distance comes this centipede, a human centipede of hikers with all their ice axes and ropes and goggles and clothes made from Mount Washington, from Mount Everest. And they've hired a guide for $1,500 or $2,000 to get them to the top. And I'm sure back in New York City where they're all from, they were telling him we're going to go spit in the face of death. We're going to go challenge Mount Washington and come back to tell about it. But when they got to the top, they found something much more horrifying. They found a fat guy and a little dog <laughs> eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Their, their faces were just blank after that. And they said, how did you get here? They, they probably thought a helicopter <laughs> dropped you in, right? I, I said, we walked. <laughs> And you did? You walked? I said, yes. Now, you're still having telephone conversations with Paige over different things that arise with Atticus? The first year of hiking, because I wanted her to see what he was doing, I was sending pictures. Yes. Uh, we had stopped somewhat. After the, after, I would send her emails, but I know she had a lot of customers, and a lot of people bought uh, puppies from her, so I didn't want to mon not monopolize her time. And so we'd go six months or a year or two years sometimes without speaking so much. Uh, but I'd always send her emails, and every now and then she'd respond and say, keep sending those memories by the wagon load. Oh, and, very nice. And she was very impressed that her little schnauzer that she loved so much had climbed all 48 of the peaks in summer. And was now shocked that he was getting ready to do them in winter. Tell us about Vicki and the Jimmy Fund. My friend Vicki Pearson was one of the great uh, byproducts of writing The Undertoad in Newburyport. My critics will hate this assessment, but the old parish priest walking around, getting to know people in so many ways, writing the undertow, making my rounds, I got to know people in so many different ways. And I was finally blowing the whistle on things that people hadn't talked to, hadn't written about in years. Because mm -hmm. the local paper may have been considered part of the, uh, part of the problem. Part of the problem. They were sitting on boards uh, with these guys and somewhat co-opted, and it's difficult to write about someone you like. I did it, and I know it was very difficult. Yep. But Vicki was one of the many people who subscribed to the paper, loved the paper, would start reaching out to me with her own stories, and decided she was going to run for school committee because of what I had been writing. She was 50 years old. She just retired from her job. She was happy. She had worked her whole life, and she loved Atticus. And whenever we go out to lunch, she'd say, let's go someplace where Atticus can go. So we did. Uh, right after Vicki was elected to the school committee, the top vote getter, uh, she was diagnosed with cancer, and it wouldn't be long before she would be dead. It was a horrible vine growing up, a uh, cancerous vine growing up her spine. But on her deathbed, she made a request for me to come see her. And when I went to see her the first day, she said to the nurse, tell him I need him to bring my nephew in. And I said, I think she's on too much morphine. I don't know who her nephew is. <laughs> and she said, it's Atticus Maxwell Finch. So we'd come in on off hours when there wasn't anyone there, and we'd sit down, Atticus lay like this, put his head on her lap, and she would pet him. And I would sit next to her bed, and she wanted to tell me the story of her life. She said, because when it's all said and done, I have something I want you to do. I want you to give my eulogy at the church with Atticus. And I said, I don't want to do that. And she said, you have no choice. You have to do that. When you're dying, that's the thing. You can tell someone, you have to do this. And they can't say no. 
And I said, I could kill you right now. <laughs> but I finally agreed. But when she died, uh, whoever was in charge of her plans changed the plans. And I felt horrible for her. And Vicky would have loved what we did. Atticus and I skipped the funeral. We went instead and walked on the beach and said some prayers for her. I said some prayers for her. But I tried to think of a way to make it up for her. And before she had died, the last year she was healthy, she did the 60-mile cancer walk, the three-day walk. And she said it was the most difficult thing she'd ever done. Now, little did we know that cancer was in her body when she was doing it. Sure. And when she ran for school committee, her motto was for the kids. So one day, I just, I couldn't think of what to do, what to do. And one day on a Friday, we were driving up to the mountains from Newburyport and listening to WEI Sports Radio. And they had the annual uh, Jimmy Fun Radiothon Telethon on. Uh, and all these kids, these three-year-old kids talking about fighting cancer, like you and I talk about going out to lunch, uh, and parents talking about losing a three-year-old child to cancer. And I'm driving up through, the through Plymouth, New Hampshire, and tears rolling down my cheeks. And then I saw the mountains, and I thought, perfect. For the kids, for Vicki, we'll try to do something that will be difficult for us. The first winter hiking, we tried to hike all 40 of the 4,000 footers. We couldn't do it. But I said, so this next winter, we'll attempt to do what no man or dog had ever done. A woman had done it, but no man or dog had ever. But of course, I yeah. should say, right? Of course. <laughs> and we'll try to hike each of the 48 twice in the 90 days of winter. So 96 peaks in 90 days. And raise money for the Jimmy Fund in Vicki Pearson's name. And you did that? We set out to do it. Uh, we came close. Uh, it has been on Animal Planet many times. Atticus and I have been featured on Dogs on One, and it's on the book that we're not giving away too much, but uh, we fell just shy. But it was an incredible winter. In my phraseology, you did it. Okay, we did it then. I need you as my publicist. <laughs> yes, you do. Atticus did struggle a little, but he forged ahead through it all. No, I don't think he much struggled much at all in the winter. Yeah. He pretty much, he was fine. It was the three weeks after. When you go back home. Right. We were back in Newburyport, and we were both, de I was depressed. When you take on this incredible quest, uh, the studies have been done when people have set out to do something physically, and they've worked towards it, this incredible goal over a long time, and they, and they fall short, or they finish it either way. It's not unlike postpartum depression mentally. Yeah. I won't compare myself to what they've been through, but the studies have shown that mentally can be like, the, you lost your purpose. So I was depressed, and it seemed like he was too. And one day I threw a cookie to him on the floor, and he didn't see it. And I thought it was strange, so I picked up and threw it again, and he still didn't see it. And I called Dr. John Grillo, our local vet in Newburyport at the time, and brought him in right away. And John said he has cataracts. And I said, what? He said, well, he's, we'll set you up an appointment with a specialist, but he's mostly blind, if not all the way. I said, how? And I thought for sure... I had caused his blindness, bringing him up the mountains two winters in a row, being above all those, above tree line where the sun was beating on the ice and snow, and I, I felt horrible. I felt like I'd let my friend down. And he said, look at sled dogs. They don't get cataracts from that. It's other things to do it, and they don't form just like that. Mm -hmm. uh, most likely, Atticus was blind leading you over those mountains, which is something I couldn't fathom. I still tear up at times thinking about it. They, you know, people always say, what's the book about? And there's a lot of different themes, but with me, uh, it's a theme of selflessness on Atticus's part, leading me over those mountains. But I always think of how he came to me from the breed of Paige Foster, who I would later find out never wanted to give him up. He was the only dog she wanted to keep, and she ends up giving him up. And she didn't, as you'll get into, we, she didn't have a very nice life, and he was all she had. So these two great teachers of selflessness, this woman who had not had a great life, giving up the only thing she really treasured to a man she didn't know who needed more than she did, and somehow Atticus leading me over 81 mountains in one winter, mostly blind. Um, how can you not be impacted by that? And since you brought it up, you call Paige. I asked if any of her other schnauzers had, had a history of this, because it can be genetic. And she said no. And Paige was an extremely honest person, and I didn't doubt her when she told me that. And I said, well, I sort of wondered because you sold him to me for $450. When I go on your website, I see all your other dogs are priced $1,500, up to $5,000. Why was he so cheap? I was thinking maybe you. And it's okay if it was because 
he's given me a great life already and we are still going to be fine. And she said, no. She said, I wouldn't have charged you anything, but I was in a bad marriage and I felt you needed it more than I did and I had to charge you something. So I, I would have given it to you for nothing if I had my way about it. I just, there was something in you I recognized that I wanted you to have Atticus in your life. At the time, he wasn't called Atticus. And just this little boy in your life, she said. Let's talk a little bit about Paige now. Tell us what, what her life was like day to day. Um, she lived on a farm, she bred dogs, married to a much older man who, uh, I have to be careful how I phrased it, the legal department of HarperCollins was very strict with how I phrased it. <laughs> um, the, the phraseology is, she would not call it abused, but I would. Uh, neglected, um, bullied in different ways, uh, didn't have much of a life. So she has a hard life, she loves Atticus, and she gives him to you. Hard life that started off as a child when her grandfather starts touching her, and it goes on for years, and as studies have shown, a lot of children think they grew up that way, and the adults think, I almost deserve this difficult life I have. So this woman who had nothing, who was not happy, who was sad, I never saw any of it. And whenever I'd call her, she'd be upbeat and gleeful. Uh, but it, little did I know at the time that he was the only dog out of so many, that she, hundreds and hundreds that she'd bred that she didn't want to give up. There was something special about him, she felt. And when she heard this stranger on the phone, she said, he needs him more than I do, so he should have him. So that selfless act again set things in motion, I believe. Take us through Atticus's illness. He's diagnosed with cataracts, he needs surgery. Take it from there. Dr. Grillo calls back and says, uh, there's a problem and it's something that takes precedent over cataracts. We found a blood test show that he has hyperthyroidism. And I said, I don't know what that is. And he said, it's extremely rare in dogs and it equates to thyroid cancer oftentimes. So the little dog who had climbed 81 mountains to fight cancer, now looked like he had it. A subsequent test showed the same results. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have any money. I'd spent it all fighting cancer with uh, raising money for the winter, and I neglected my newspaper. But I'd been writing a blog, and I'd been writing it about, about a paper, what we had done. And out of nowhere, in three weeks' time, cancer survivors, school children, business owners in Newburyport, friends, politicians, honest cops, even a couple of Cops I would have called dirty in the past. Um, and hikers sent in uh, $9,000 for his eye surgery and whatever else he would need. He had the eye surgery, everything went well. And then we scheduled an appointment with Angel Animal Medical Center with Maureen uh, Carroll, an incredible internist there to take care of thyroid cancer. And we went in, uh, supposed thyroid cancer, the hyperthyroidism. And we went to the doctor that day and I said to her, what's the chance this could be a fluke, that he doesn't really have it, the blood test was wrong. She said, one test, yes, two tests, no, most likely not. So most likely we, he probably, had, we'll see what happens with the blood test, but most likely we have to deal with this and this will show us where to start. But leaving Angel Animal Medical Center, I felt this great hope because everyone there was so pleasant and so nice, including Maureen and uh, Nowitzki, her aide. A week later, I got a call uh, that it disappeared and she couldn't figure out why. Ann was on the phone with me saying, we just can't, whether it's the power of prayer, whether it's the power of friendship. And of course, there's a little Tibetan monk that comes involved at this time too. Just wonderful, I mean. So a clean bill of health, he can see. We go back for regular checkups for his blood work and he's fine, uh, nothing. But that's not the end of your relationship with Angel Memorial. No. Tell us about that. Well, as you know, uh, I don't know if you ever saw the movie with uh, Burt Reynolds in the 70s or the 80s, I think it was the 70s, called The End, where he wants to kill himself. No, And never it's with happened. Dom DeLuise. Yeah. And they were always on these movies together. And Dom DeLuise is a split personality. He's a regular dumpy guy. And then he becomes this superhero called Him. Dun, dun, dun. And he shows up. <laughs> and so Burt Reynolds decides he wants to kill himself. But he, every time he tries, he chickens out. So he enlists the superheroes help to help kill him. And he decides that very end of the movie, he runs out in the ocean and he swims out as far as he can to drown. And he says, I will uh, kill myself this way. And he can't swim. And then he starts to drown. He's going to die. And he's finally saying goodbye to God. And then he decides he wants to live. So he says, God, help me. Save me in any way you can. 
I'll swim back to shore. If you teach me to swim, I'll give you everything I make a year. And then he starts the making it. The prayer of the hopeless. Go ahead. <laughs> he gets about halfway in and he says, God, thank you. I'm going to do it. I need some more help. Could you get me a little bit further? If you get me there, I'll give you half of what I make. <laughs> and he gets he only a quarter way to go. And he says, God, I'm, I think I'm going to make it. I'll give you 10%. <laughs> and then he gets to shore and he says, Can I just say thank you. Would that, be, would that even us up? <laughs> but when, I, when Atticus was diagnosed, I was floored. I was devastated. Uh, no matter how much they said it had nothing to do with my choices, I felt guilty. And I made a promise to God and to Atticus that if we survived this, I would sell the newspaper and Atticus and I would move up to the mountains where he was happiest. And that's what, in a roundabout way, we ended up doing that. And watching Atticus look out with his new eyes one day off of Franconia Ridge or Cannon Mountain, one of the two, I came up with the idea of raising money for Angel Animal Medical Center. They'd given us so much hope and I wanted to pay back to other people who had helped us. So we would attempt to do the same quest, 96 Peaks in 90 Days, to raise money for, the, for uh, Angel Animal Medical Center during the winter of 2007-2008. And I, I must applaud you for that. Thank you. Well, thank Wonder, you. Wonderful thing to do. The next significant thing in your book is you have to say goodbye to Dad. Tell us about that. It wasn't bad. Uh, my father said to me at one point, because I was writing letters to him, and we hadn't actually spoken for almost a year, because he, had, he would go down some pretty dark paths. And I would say, Dad, strike one. If you do this again, uh, it would be strike two, strike three, I'm going to pull away. But I had to make a decision at the time with his verbal abuse, if I'd be willing at his age, is it, he was elderly, in his 80s, that it could be the last time I ever saw him. But I remember him saying to me at one point, when I go, out of all my children, you won't have a problem with it. I know you love me. You've expressed it. But you've worked out the issues we've had. And you're a pretty happy guy. And I knew I wouldn't have a problem. Um, at the end of that winter raising money for Angel, it was Easter Sunday. Uh, or the Easter Saturday, I went back to see him. Actually, I went to see him in the nursing home just before then. I got a call that he was in there. And we hadn't spoken for a while. I continued to write to him. Um, and when I saw him in the nursing home, he didn't know who I was. And uh, I decided to ask him questions about his children. And I went through all of them, all nine of us, starting with uh, Joanne, the oldest, John, the next, Claire, and then working his way down to me. And he had bad things to say about almost all of us, <laughs> except for one. And we get to the end of me. I said, what can you tell him about Tommy, the youngest? He's the biggest jerk of all, although he didn't say jerk. And I said, I've heard that too. <laughs> Why is it? He doesn't care about me. He won't come see me. I said, I heard he was here. No, he wouldn't see me. I said, well, what, what can you tell me about him? He's married now. I said, really? <laughs> he said, he is. I said, I, I didn't know that. Oh, you didn't know? I said, no. He said, uh, what's your name? I can't remember. He said, but they have a little boy. And that's why he won't talk to me. His name is Atticus. <laughs> and right then, Atticus looked up, <laughs> and a connection was made again. And he sort of came around after that. And I saw him one more time, and he looked clear, and he looked happy. And my brothers David, Eddie, and myself saw him on Saturday for Easter. And he was in the hospital now. He had gotten worse. We went to see him, but his eyes were clear. He was lucid. And my brother David and, and Eddie and David are very serious. Good people, but very serious. Do you know what this weekend is, Dad? No. It's Easter weekend. Do you know what that means? Ham? <laughs> and David said, most of your children are here, so there's a chance they're going to come see you the next day. And I said, and I used to work with nursing homes where people are passing away all the time. And I had a good relationship with my father. I could tell him I loved him, unlike my brothers and sisters for the most part. And I said, you know what else that means? And he said, what? I said, it'd be a good weekend to kick the bucket and let yourself go. You've done all your work. You don't need to be here. Don't worry about it. Say goodbye to everybody. Little I know the next day on a hike I'd come home, he would die. <laughs> and so my brothers and sisters didn't get to see him. Yeah. My brother David gave a great eulogy. A guy who doesn't communicate well or open up his heart well, he didn't give this incredible eulogy for my father. And he said the one thing my father always wanted was a standing ovation. And at the end, he got off the left the, the altar and we all stood up and clapped for my father. My father wanted to be immortal. He wanted to be famous in some way. 
and I take a lot of pride in knowing that through our story. You see an honest view of him. His only remaining sister read it and said, what comes through more than anything is your love of your father, that you loved him and you forgave and you moved on as best you could. Um, and so my father is immortal and he's tied with these mountains that he loved, Jack Ryan's mountains for all these years. Yes. You and Atticus received the Human Hero Award. Tell us about that night and that terrific honor. Uh, we were uh, given the award at the MSPCA uh, at the JFK Presidential Library and they give out four awards a year, a Young Hero Award, uh, a Animal Hero, uh, a Humanitarian Award, which went to Emmy Lou Harris, Amanda McDonald, a young woman who fought against Greyhound Racing during the election that year, uh, won it for the Young Hero Award, and the Boston Police Dogs got it for Animal Hero Awards. It's so funny that Tom Ryan and Atticus M. Finch are co-recipients of the Human Hero Award because it, takes, it took a dog, it took two dogs and a very incredible breeder to make me uh, more human. And uh, one of the things that I did with Max, and I talk about this in the story, Max never got to see the places Atticus got to see. But I wanted Max to have a life, and I wasn't sure why I saved most of his ashes. So when we hiked the 48, 4,000 foot peaks those winters, I would sprinkle a little bit of his ashes on each peak. So Max is up here along with my father. But there's part of Max that was also deposited at the JFK Presidential Library. And I'll never say where, so they can't get him out of there. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> Tell us about your connection back to Paige. If I'm right about something, somewhere along the way, a romance or a romantic interest develops. I think seven years of a common interest in Atticus, or six and a half years of a common interest, uh, was going on. And I was reviewing my life with Atticus because I decided I wanted to write a story. And someone, a reporter once asked me, did you do the hikes to write about it or did you do the hikes because you loved it and then write about it because you're a writer? I said, I wrote about it after the facts. Um, and I was sharing some stories with Paige and sending stories back and forth. And we were emailing back and forth. And then it became more and more connected and we talked more and more and we became more human. And for the first time, we weren't always talking about Atticus. We were talking about her life and my life. And uh, right around the time we got the Human Hero Award, I told her it was as much her award as it was mine. And if she had been there, I would have had her on stage with us to share it with her. And I had no idea her life had been so bad. I had no idea she had had such a tough time of it. And I also had no idea, I would later learn that she gave up the dog she didn't want to give up. And she would tell me, in those months before, right, right after we got the award, and I got to know her better, that every time she sent a puppy off to live with somebody, she feels she was sitting on the shore and sitting off each puppy in a little boat to go live a life where they were loved and happy and connected and safe and nurtured. And she said, because they were living the life I couldn't live. But when she was a little girl at one point, when things were happening bad to her, she told her mother, someday I'm going to run 2,000 miles away and live in the mountains where no one can find me. And little did she know that when she sent off Atticus to me, and little did I know that things would transpire. And I would send her email pictures, and she'd touch the screen of seeing him on Mount Washington, a Bond Cliff, or Lafayette, and she'd trace her finger on the mountains that he was standing on top of and look at things she had seen. And he was, without me knowing it, was living the life she wished she had. In the mountains, Atticus became more of what he'd always been, and I became less. Less frantic, less stressed, less worried, unless Harry's. I felt comfortable letting him lead, and he seemed to know what I needed. He always chose the best route, if ever there was a question, and my only job was to follow. Most important though, what made us happiest was being together in a place where we could be equals and there were no rules to adhere to. So there you have it, from the White Mountains. Thank you for joining us, our discussion with Tom Ryan on his wonderful book, Following Atticus. Until next time, get active, take a hike, and you be well.